but we are in John 1. And our text begins at verse 35. Now we've already looked at verse 35 and many of the following verses. And just to remind you, because it's been a few weeks since we've been here, just to give you some context, what we're looking at here is Jesus is meeting uh, some of the men that will be his disciples and will be his apostles. And some in this passage are going to get saved. Some in this passage have already been saved because they've been under the ministry of John the Baptist. Others are going to get saved as they are introduced for the first time to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we walk down through this passage and we, we watch the interaction between Jesus and these dis, soon-to-be disciples and followers of Christ, uh, it's, it's amazing to watch how Jesus introduces himself and how he is introduced uh, to these men. But it's also amazing to, to note how Jesus is revealed in many different ways. In this passage, as we go down through the passage, we're going to see how Jesus is revealed, not just to them, but to us today. In verses 35 and 36, this is where Jesus meets Andrew and more than likely John, the apostle, the writer of this, this gospel. And he's revealed to be the Lamb of God in verse number 36. In verses 37 and 38, Jesus is, is revealed to us as rabbi or master in verse number 38. They call him master, rabbi, which is interpreted as master. So we know Jesus as the Lamb of God. We, we learn of him as master here in this passage. From verses 39 down to verse 41, uh, Jesus is now being revealed as the Christ, the Messiah in verse number 41. We see the Bible says that we have found the Messiah, the Bible says, the Christ, in verse number 41. So he is the Lamb of God. He's the Master. He's Lord. He's, he's the Messiah. He's the anointed, sent one. In verses 42 down through 45, we find that Jesus is the prophesied one. Look at verse number 45 where the Bible says, Of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. The Old Testament is about Jesus Christ. And here, Jesus is revealing himself as the prophesied one. And now today, we're going to begin in verse number 46. Now, we, when we left off the last time, we were looking at Philip and his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, and now Nathaniel and his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, let's go back. Uh, to verse number 43, to get a little more context here. The Bible says, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Beth Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael. And as I stated last time, many believe that this is the disciple called Bartholomew. And the Bible says, And saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is, so this is Philip speaking to Nathanael about Jesus. Then in 40, verse 46, the Bible says, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be, or can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip reveals to him, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, the son of Joseph, and he is the one that the Old Testament spoke of. And Nathaniel couldn't help but respond by saying, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a town that was greatly looked down upon. But that may very well be the reason why God chose for Jesus to be raised in Nazareth. For that very purpose. To, to show that it does not matter who you are or where you came from or how the world of those around you sees you. If Jesus is in you, it's a wonderful thing. Jesus will lift you above your background. He'll lift you above your past. What the world and society looks down upon, that's who Jesus wants to get glory from. And that's what happens with the city of Nazareth. What can come out of Nazareth of any good thing and the Bible says, Philip says, here's Philip's response in verse 46. Philip said unto him, 
come and see. Well, just come and see. Come and see for yourself who Jesus is. In verse 47, the Bible says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, this is Jesus now, who has not had a physical encounter with Nathanael. But look what Jesus says about Nathanael. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile or no deceit. Now Jesus, humanly speaking, doesn't know Nathanael. Nathanael certainly doesn't know Jesus. But Jesus expresses what he does know about Nathanael. He says, you're an Israelite indeed, whom is no guile. And Nathanael asked this question, saith unto him, verse 48, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know who I am? That's a good question. If we've never met one another, how do you know who I am? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now that's when the light went off in Nathanael's mind. See, Jesus, he knows of the private conversation that Philip and Nathanael had. But he also says that he saw him, saw Nathanael, when Nathanael was under the fig tree. And the fig tree there in Israel was oftentimes used as a place where Jewish men would go to pray and to meditate. So he knows of this private prayer closet, if you will, that Nathan had, Nathaniel had uh, in that, under that fig tree. Jesus is aware of this. He's aware of this private conversation. He's aware of the prayer life of Nathaniel. That's when the light went off. And Nathaniel answered and said unto him, verse 49, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. How else could Jesus know about that private conversation? How else could Jesus know about the prayer life of Nathaniel under the fig tree unless Jesus was the Son of God? which in the Bible is a term of deity. In fact, here in this gospel in John 10, Jesus finds himself in a controversy over this very fact that he called himself the Son of God and the Jews saw that as him claiming to be God, claiming to him, for him to be deity. But he is deity. Jesus is God. He is the very Son of God. And the same God that knew everything about Philip and Nathaniel and the rest of them, knows everything about you and I today. He knows your ups and downs. He knows your bad. He knows your good. He knows every single thing about you and I. He is the omniscient, all-knowing Son of God. He knows. He knows who I am. He knows my past. He knows my background. He knew theirs. He, knew, he knows yours. And knowing who they were, he still desired to be their Savior, and He desires to be yours as well. As the Son of God. He's not just a mere man. Jesus is a human being. I'll say more that, about that in just a moment. He is a man, yet without sin. He is the God-man. He is the Son of God, who became the Son of Man to bring God himself and man together through the saving work of Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's revealed to be the Son of God. But Nathaniel doesn't stop there. Look at the end of verse 49. Thou art the King of Israel. Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. He's not just God himself and the Son of God. He's the one we've been waiting on. He's the king of Israel. And he's to be worshipped as king. Now, Israel did not receive Jesus as king the first time he came. They rejected him as Messiah. They rejected him as king. He, he did not meet their particular standards that they thought he should have. Although he fulfilled the Old Testament in every point, 
as to who he was to be as the Messiah, as the king. They rejected him nonetheless. But there's going to come a day where Israel will receive Jesus as their king, as their Messiah. It's not going to be today. But if Jesus comes back and gets the church today, and we go to heaven, the next seven years from this point will be a time of tribulation on this earth. And at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, Jesus is coming back, and at that time, the nation of Israel will receive him as king. But Nathaniel was seeing that, recognizing that only the Son of God, the King of Israel, could do and know what you do and know. And so therefore, we see who Jesus is in this passage. We're learning who Jesus is. Now in verse 50, this is where we see a very interesting reference to the Old Testament that Jesus makes here. Look at verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? In other words, because I know who you are and I express that and I revealed to you that I know who you are and I, I knew of you sitting under that fig tree, because of that you believe, thou shalt see greater things than these. In other words, if you think that was impressive, just wait. Just wait what you're about to see. Now, Jesus at this point we've seen has been revealed as the Son of God. He's been re revealed as the King of Israel. But in verse 51, he's going to reveal himself as the way to heaven. The way to heaven. Look at verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter, from this point on, ye shall see heaven open." and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Isn't that an odd thing to say? Nathaniel, from this point on, you're going to see heaven open up, and you're going to see the angels of God ascending, going up, and descending, coming down upon the Son of Man. What does that even mean? What a strange thing to say. Now, Nathaniel, and if anyone else was in this scene, maybe Philip, heard what he was saying, more than likely their mind went back to the Old Testament. And maybe you remember of a story where angels are ascending and descending in the Old Testament. In fact, that takes place in Genesis 28. In Genesis 28, the first book of the Bible, in Genesis 28, Jacob the son of Isaac, the son who was the son of Abraham, the grandson of Abraham, Jacob. He's having a dream. And in this dream, he sees a ladder. And the Bible says that that ladder went from the earth and extended all the way to heaven. And Jacob, in his dream of this ladder, sees angels going up the ladder and coming down, ascending and descending. Makes me think of a, an escalator, maybe. They're, they're going up, and they're coming down on this ladder. So Jacob, in this dream, he sees this ladder. Angels going up and down. The, the ladder extends from earth all the way to heaven, the Bible says. But here, Jesus says in John 1, the angels are not ascending and descending upon a ladder. They are ascending and descending upon Jesus himself. And I think what Jesus is saying here is, Jesus is the ladder. Amen. Jesus is the ladder. A ladder is used to go from a low place to get to a high place. And Jesus is the ladder to heaven. He is the way to get from earth to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. But it just so happens that that place where Jacob had that dream, he named that place Bethel, which means the house of God. You know what Jesus wants to do this morning in the house of God? He wants somebody to get on that ladder this morning. 
He wants somebody to trust him at the house of God. And by the way, he's the only ladder to heaven. Jacob didn't see multiple ladders. He only saw one. He only saw one. Jacob in his dream only saw one ladder. I have a message. I haven't preached it in years. I'm not even sure if I preached it at resurrection. It may, it may be the first church that I pastored last time I preached it. It's called a dream come true. Jacob sees a dream in a dream. He sees that ladder. Well, that dream came true when Jesus came to this world and died for our sins on a cross and rose again a third day and he made the way to heaven. In fact, he is the way to heaven. In this very gospel, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the ladder, if you will. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father. Nobody gets from earth to heaven, but by me, he said it. So Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the King of Israel. Jesus is the way of heaven. But right at the end of verse number 51, he reveals himself again. In his revelation of him being the way to heaven, he refers to himself in another way. He says in verse 51, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In the Gospel of John, this is the first time you see the phrase, the Son of Man. But this is Jesus' favorite term for himself in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As you read the four Gospels, he calls himself the Son of Man more than any other term. More than even the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man. That's the last thing we see revealed of Christ in this passage. So what's the significance of the Son of Man? Why would this term be so important to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't he just go around and just let everybody know, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Son of God. Why does he emphasize the Son of Man? By calling himself the Son of God, we know, he, he's, he is God. He's connected to God. He's our connection to God. But when he says, I'm the son of man, now he's revealing his connection to us. He's showing that he is one of us, yet without sin. This is Christmas season. I have another message I have not preached in years called Celebrating the Virgin Conception. I personally, I'm not going to get into all this. You can discuss it later if you want to. I personally don't believe, as in Clint referred to this uh, earlier in the service, I don't believe Jesus was born in December. I'm not going to have a big fight over that, but I, I'm glad we celebrate it. But I personally believe Jesus was born around September. I'm not going to get into that today, but maybe one day I will. I believe it was around September, maybe early October. Uh, Jesus was born. So if you do the math, if Jesus is born around September, that means the conception would have been around December. And I preach the message on celebrating the virgin conception of Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus was conceived during this month, born in September. And plus, it makes me happy that he might be born in September because I saved in September and that makes me feel good about it. <laughs> but Jesus was born of, in Fundamental Baptist Church, we still believe in the virgin birth Amen. of Jesus Christ. If I stop believing in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, take me outside, hang me from a tree, let's end this thing. That is a fundamental of the faith. See, if Jesus isn't born of a virgin, if he, if he has the assistance biologically of an earthly father to be born into this world, then he's born with a sin nature, just like you and I. And if he's born with a sin nature, there's no hope for us because he's just like us. If he's born with a sin nature, then he himself is a sinner. You and I are born with sin natures. The Bible says we even lie in our infancy. We come out of our mama's womb ready to sin. 
because of our sin nature. But Jesus had no biologically, biological earthly father. Therefore, he was born without a sin nature. Yet, he was born of a woman so that he could be the Son of Man and connect to you and I. You and I had to have someone related to us that could die for us. It's one of the reasons why we know that evolution is a farce. Possibly the greatest hoax ever believed by man is evolution. But ultimately, evolution is an attack on the person of Jesus Christ. Because evolution teaches that you and I and the animal world, we all came from the same place. And so therefore, we're all related to one another. We're, we're related to the dogs and the cats and the cows and the pigs. But that's not what the Bible says. The human world is different than the animal world. We come from a different source. If we all came from the same place, then we are related to the animals. Therefore, those Old Testament animal sacrifices would have been legitimate and salvific because we're kin to them. But evolution, teaching that we're related to them, says that we are nothing but animals. And that, and that goat, that sheep, that lamb is just, as, is just as related to us as we are to them. And, and therefore, there would be no need for the death of Christ because of our relationship to those animals. But because evolution is a lie, it's not true, it's a deception. There is a distinct difference between animals and human beings, and therefore we're not related to the animals. The only time I really relate to them is on a dinner plate. <laughs> Their sacrifice did not take away sin because we're not kin to them. You go back to the Old Testament, read the book of Ruth, you see this pictured with Boaz and Ruth. Ruth had to have a kinsman redeemer. If anyone was going to redeem her and Naomi's household, it had to be someone that was related to her. And there just so happened to be a distant relative named Boaz who was willing to pay the price to redeem Ruth. They needed a kinsman redeemer. And so did you and I. We needed someone related to us that was willing to pay the ultimate price so that you and I would not lose it all and go to hell, but we would gain it all and go to heaven. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So about a little over 2,000 years ago, he came to this earth. He was born of a virgin woman, born without sin so that he could be a sacrifice, but born of a woman, so that he could be kin to us and be our kinsman redeemer and pay the ultimate price. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He shed his blood as a payment for your sin and mine. And unlike those Old Testament sacrifices, those animals, where God commanded the sacrifice but did not accept those sacrifices as the ultimate payment, when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His spirit went up, his soul went into the heart of the earth, and his body went into the grave. And I believe when his spirit went into the third heaven for his father, his body is still on the throne, excuse me, on the on the cross. His blood has been shed. And on that Passover day, when the blood of that Passover lamb was shed, the Spirit of Christ presents His blood and His sacrifice. Jesus Christ, the mercy seat. There's my shed blood. There's my body broken. There's the mercy seat. There is the sacrifice. And God the Father accepted that payment, fully, finally, and forever as a payment for our sin. And to prove that he accepted that sacrifice three days later, 
that broken body walked out of that tomb. The reason why we know that God did not accept the Old Testament sacrifices is because all them animals are still dead. But Jesus Christ rose again three days later because God the Father accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. By the way, he accepts no other sacrifice. There's no sacrifice that you can offer. There's no sacrifice that I can offer. He only accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to heaven. You say, well, I need to do this, and I need to do that, and I need to do this in order to help myself to help. No, sir, friend, you come by way of Jesus Christ or you don't come at all. Amen. He's the only sacrifice. The only sacrifice. It's interesting. Early Sunday morning, Jesus walks out of that tomb. And Mary comes to the tomb it's empty. Remember, she sees Jesus in the garden. She assumed he was the gardener. And she asked, where, where have they taken him? And he said one word, Mary. And when he said her name, she recognized that voice. She, be, she believed, you're alive, you're alive. Do y'all remember she went, to, she went to hug him? She went to embrace him. I would have wanted to. There's my Lord and Savior who walked out of the tomb. He said, touch me not, I'm not yet ascended. Now, three days before, his spirit went to heaven and presented his sacrifice. Well, there he was on the cross on that Passover day. But on Sunday, it wasn't Passover. It was first fruits. The Sunday after Passover was always first fruits. And the Feast of First Fruits, what that was, was uh, the, the farmers there would collect the first fruits of the harvest. This was not the main harvest. This was just the first fruits of the harvest, the early, early harvest. But that early harvest was given to them by God as a promise that a greater harvest is coming down the road. But they were not allowed to eat anything of those first fruits harvest. Nothing. Until first they presented it before God as a wave offering. And when they waved those first fruit offerings to God, then they could utilize it and eat and partake of the first fruits offering. They could not until it was presented as a wave offering. Jesus tells Mary on that Sunday, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended. You know what he's about to do? He's about to go to heaven and present himself as the first fruit. I'm the first fruit. He is the wave offering. I could see Jesus waving his own hands to the Father. I am the wave offering. I have arisen from that. 1 Corinthians 15 calls Jesus the first fruits. And that first fruit was a promise that a bigger harvest was coming down the road. And because Jesus got up, we're all going to get up. The big harvest is coming. When the rapture takes place, the big harvest is coming. And the fact that Jesus got up from the grave is a promise. It's assurance that the great harvest is coming down the road. Now remember, he said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended. He had not presented himself as the first fruit offering yet. She can't partake of him yet. Can't touch him. He's got to be presented. You can't enjoy the resurrection until I'm presented before the Father. But later that evening, touch me all you want. Hand on me. A week later, he tells Thomas, put your finger in my side, in my hands. Go ahead. Touch me all you Enjoy the resurrected Christ all you want because he's been presented as the first fruits before God. And now we can have all of Jesus that we want. He's a son of man, born of a virgin so that he could relate to God and be sinless but born of a woman so he can relate to us as the Son of Man. Therefore, the Son of God came down to be the Son of Man 
so that he can take the sons of men and make us sons of God. That's why that's his favorite term. His favorite term for himself was son of man because in that term, he's telling us, I'm related to you. I'm related to you. And I want you to be related to me. We're all related to Jesus by humanity. But he wants us to be related to him by his sacrifice, by his blood. And that is by faith. You think about this. This world is filled with human beings that hate Jesus Christ. That will cuss him with every breath they can. Yet they're related to him. Humanly speaking, we're all related to each other. Joe Biden's a distant cousin. Let that sink in. Yeah. One of them cousins we don't claim, you know how it is. But we're all related. We're all kin to one another. That means we're all related somehow to Jesus Christ, humanly speaking. You know what that means? Whosoever will may come. You know why it's whosoever will? It's because he's related to everybody. Amen. And if you want him, he's already a kinsman. If you want him to be your kinsman redeemer, trust him. You trust him today. He will save your soul from sin. He'll save your soul from hell. And he'll save your soul for heaven. If you come to him. So have you come to him? Do you trust him? The Christmas season, I love Christmas. The only time that even compares to Christmas, as far as I'm concerned, is, is fall because that's football season. I've talked to y'all about these fall weddings y'all keep having. I don't know about all that. Interrupting football. That's why God gave you all them other months for marriage. I'm just kidding. I love Christmas season. Most of y'all probably have a tree put up. Maybe some of you already have, have your gifts put under the tree. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, the greatest gift that you'll ever have was not put under a tree. It was put on a tree. Amen. And it was the broken body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his body he bore our sins, and with his blood he made the payment for our sins. And if you receive that gift of Jesus Christ, you'll also come, it comes with the gift of forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life. It all comes through trusting Jesus Christ. Now, I know how I know how it was growing up in my house. Well, you know, if you're if you're good this year, you'll get blah 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 blah. My mom they lied to me so much. I was as bad as could be and still got all them presents. <laughs> and just as much as it was not based on your goodness to get that Christmas gift, it was not based on your goodness to receive salvation. You do not go to heaven by being a good person. You go to heaven by receiving the gift of Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons why I love Christmas so much. Because there's so many pictures of Jesus Christ and his salvation. And one of the glorious pictures is, as a kid, I got everything I asked for and didn't earn one present. When I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, I got everything I asked for plus more. And I never did anything to get it because I couldn't. I only could receive it. And that's all you can do with a gift. You can receive it or reject it. Some of you may have received a gift before and you opened it up and said, nope, don't want that. You're very rude, by the way. You're very rude. But that may have happened. But how rude is it for Jesus Christ to shed all of his blood to keep your sorry soul out of hell and you say, I don't want that. I don't want that. 
My friend, if that's been your attitude up to this point, repent, turn to Christ, trust Him, receive His gift of salvation, and you'll get on that ladder that goes all the way to heaven.